Well, hello everyone. Phil here from the Blue Envelope channel. I thought I'd take a minute today and do a quick little video on the uh, governing body update that just came out. There's quite a few big changes in there that I thought might be worth talking about. I counted eight myself, so I'm just going to kind of go through them one by one and talk about them. So this is the 2024 governing body update number two. It was released on March 15th, 2024. And without further ado, let's look at change number one. Presently, a committee of elders normally meets with a wrongdoer only one time. However, the governing body has decided that the committee may decide to meet with the person more than once. Okay, so historically, you'd have a judicial committee meeting, and it was a single meeting. And at the end of that night, your punishment was announced. Uh, it could be private reproof, public reproof, those two were if you were repentant, or it could be disfellowshipping if you were deemed unrepentant. And, uh, you know, as a reminder, the formation of a judicial committee is not really to find out guilt or innocence. You're basically already deemed guilty if the committee is formed. It's really just to decide what level of punishment you need. So with this change that there might be several meetings as part of this judicial process, uh, the verdict won't necessarily be handed down on the first meeting. To be honest, I'm not really sure if this is an improvement or or not. Um, you know, it at least means you may not be disfellowshipped right off the bat that first day. On the other hand, judicial committee meetings are super stressful, and so having multiple sessions doesn't sound real awesome either. So, okay, let's go on to number two. What about baptized minors, those under 18 years of age, who engage in serious wrongdoing? Under our current arrangement, such a baptized minor, along with his Christian parents, must meet with a committee of elders. Under our new arrangement, two elders will meet with the minor and his Christian parents. The elders will find out what steps the parents have already taken to help their child come to repentance. If the minor has a good attitude and the parents are reaching him, the two elders might decide that it isn't necessary to take the matter any further. Of course, the elders will occasionally check with the parents to make sure that the minor is getting the help he needs. However, what if a baptized minor unrepentantly persists in a wrong course? In that case, a committee of elders would meet with him along with his Christian parents. All right, so this is an interesting change, and under it, minors would probably be less likely to experience a judicial committee that could then result in them being disfellowshipped and shunned. This change seems to me to be pretty directly related to the recent trials in Norway where Jehovah's Witnesses lost their funding and their uh, country registration because of their practice of shunning. I don't know that it's connected exactly to their most recent loss there in court a week or two ago, since I'm sure this video update has been in the works for a while, but it's probably related to that overall situation over there. So yeah, minors would not necessarily need a judicial committee for their quote-unquote sins. Additionally, it shifts more of the responsibility onto the parents for the child's punishment or discipline, and then it removes some of that responsibility or culpability away from the religion for the way the child is treated. So I think probably it will result in slightly less childhood trauma, which is good, although I think it really depends now on the parents and what they do to the child. Additionally, it still leaves open the possibility of a judicial committee if the child, quote, unrepentantly persists in a wrong course. It also depends on whether the child has a, quote, good attitude and whether, quote, the parents are reaching him, all of which seem fairly subjective. Okay, let's move on to number three. This is describing what happens after a judicial committee decides to disfellowship someone. The elders will explain that they'd like to meet with the individual again after a few months to see if he's had a change of heart. If the individual is willing to meet, the elders will make a warm appeal for him to repent and return. So this, uh, I believe, is a totally new policy. To my understanding, elders typically only contact disfellowshipped ones once a year. Now, I'm not sure exactly when that starts after the disfellowshipping, if they wait a full year or if it starts sooner than that. But uh, other than that contact, otherwise it's historically always been the disfellowship person's responsibility to reach out to the elders to try and get reinstated. 
Now, elders will proactively reach out to recently disfellowshipped persons to help them get reinstated and be back to being an active publisher in the congregation. Now, there is a passage in the um, Elder's Handbook, Shepherd the Flock of God, uh, section 19.6. It says, The committee should be careful to allow sufficient time, perhaps many months, a year, or even longer, for a disfellowshipped or disassociated person to demonstrate that he is genuinely repentant. So with that in mind, I'm not exactly sure whether this new direction means a person can be reinstated within a few months or merely that the elders will keep in closer contact with them during that period that is still going to last a year or more before they can be reinstated. Okay, let's go to number four. What about individuals who were disfellowshipped in the past, perhaps even many years ago? In some cases, they may not even recall the reason they were disfellowshipped they may have abandoned their wrong course years ago. The governing body has decided that the elders should visit such ones, pray with them, and make a warm appeal for them to return to the congregation. If a person's been away from the congregation for many years, he would no doubt be very weak spiritually. Therefore, if such a person is willing, the elders could arrange for him to have a Bible study even before he's reinstated. Of course, the individual would have to want to return to the congregation, and the elders would always be the ones to arrange for such a study. I think this new policy relates to the fact that the majority of judicial cases are because of sex outside marriage. For example, the Watchtower of January 1st, 1986 says on page 13, It is to be noted also that during the past year, 36,638 individuals had to be disfellowshipped from the Christian congregation, the greater number of them for practicing immorality. And then here's a quote from the Watchtower, September 15th, 1987, on page 13. Unfortunately, during the 1986 service year, 37,426 had to be disfellowshipped from the Christian congregation, the greater number of them for practicing sexual immorality. And this does not include the even higher number reproved for immorality, but not disfellowshipped because they were sincerely repentant. So you have this situation where lots of people get disfellowshipped for sex, uh, and then many of them just go on to marry their paramour, or at any rate, they're married now and living very ordinary lives with no sexual hijinks anymore. So they would actually be a really good candidate to be reinstated. Now, I would take issue with that statement that some people might not even remember what they were disfellowshipped for. I doubt that there's few, if any, people that don't remember their judicial committee and what it was about. So these ones can have a Bible study with someone before being reinstated while they're still disfellowshipped. It mentions that the elders would arrange the study, although it doesn't say an elder would necessarily have to be the one studying with the person. So we'll have to see. But that would make sense, especially if the person's a a woman. They probably wouldn't want to have an elder meeting her every week. And, you know, it makes sense that a person who perhaps has been disfellowshipped for a number of years would almost need to have a Bible study just to get back up to speed on what (laughs) witnesses believe these days. There's been a lot of changes over the years. And I think, too, this outreach program makes a lot of sense. You know, if we had to think about which people on earth are most likely to be future members of Jehovah's Witnesses, well, I think the number one group is probably the children of current members. But who's the second most likely group? It would probably have to be past members who've let their membership lapse, either from inactivity or from being disfellowshipped. There's a lot of pomy witnesses out there, physically out, mentally in. They still believe the doctrine. They may be done sowing their wild oats now, and they're really primed to rejoin the religion. And that's why Sanderson offers this invitation. If you are a disfellowshipped person listening to this update, we urge you to accept the efforts of the elders to help you return to the congregation. If you're living in an area where you don't know the local elders, please feel free to call or visit the local Kingdom Hall and request spiritual assistance. Jehovah wants you to come home, and we do too. We're seeing this phrase, coming home, cropping up a little more recently. It ties in well to that recent music video, Home, which was about inactive witnesses, but it works equally as well for disfellowshipped people. Okay, on to change number five. In keeping with the scriptural admonition at 1 Corinthians 5.11, 
when a person has been removed from the congregation, we stop keeping company with that person, not even eating with such a man. That means we don't socialize with those who are removed from the congregation. However, that does not mean that a Christian could not invite a disfellowship person to attend a congregation meeting. That disfellowship person could be a relative, a former Bible student, or someone we were close to in the past. Okay, so big change here. Witnesses can talk to disfellowshipped ones to invite them to the meetings. In the past, you know, it's been a very hard line of going total no contact with anyone disfellowshipped by the elders with limited exceptions for immediate family members, but not anymore. He specifically mentions in this video that one example could be inviting them to the memorial this year, which is just a week away. So clearly the encouragement is to contact disfellowshipped friends or family right away, like this week. And that goes along with the next change, number six. What if a disfellowship person comes to a congregation meeting? Under our current arrangement, we don't say a greeting to individuals who've been removed from the congregation. However, the governing body has decided that publishers can use their Bible-trained conscience to decide whether to give a simple greeting and welcome a disfellowshipped individual who attends a congregation meeting. Hi, so good to see you here. Thank you. While we wouldn't have an extended conversation or socialize with such a person, we do not need to ignore him completely. So another big change here, there can be limited talking to disfellowshipped ones who are present at the meetings up from the uh, zero talking allowed previously, or as he describes it, ignoring them completely. Now, like most listeners, I, at this point, I immediately said, well, wait a second. What about 2 John 10 and 11, which has that verse that we shouldn't even say a greeting to such ones and saying a greeting is equivalent to sharing in their wicked works. You know, in the past Watchtower study articles have delved deep into the Greek words for greeting used in these verses to explain that even saying hello isn't allowed. And then just a simple greeting might be enough to sustain someone's need for contact and keep them from working to get reinstated. Well, he goes on to address that. In examining the context of those verses, the governing body has concluded that the Apostle John was really describing apostates and others who actively promote wrong conduct. For good reason, John strongly directed Christians not even to greet such a person because of his contaminating influence. Therefore, if a disfellowship individual is a known apostate or someone who actively promotes wrongdoing, the elders would not visit him. Neither would individual Christians greet such a person or invite him to attend a congregation meeting. So yeah, we get some new light on 2 John, and uh, we also get this caveat to the new policy, which is that it doesn't apply to known apostates or someone actively promoting wrongdoing. Unfortunately, he doesn't really explain or give any examples of what that might mean. I'm not sure if someone, you know, living with their significant other maybe, but hasn't ever gotten married, if that would qualify as actively promoting wrongdoing or if it requires you to be doing something more overtly evil in your life. Okay, let's go on to number seven. The governing body has decided that sisters may choose to wear slacks when participating in the ministry and when attending Christian meetings, assemblies, and conventions. If a sister chooses to wear slacks on such occasions, they should not be casual, but dignified, modest, and appropriate. When a sister has a part on the program, she should wear a skirt or a dress if that is the standard of dress in that land. Of course, some sisters may choose to wear a skirt or a dress even when they do not have a part on the program. So another big change, well, a huge change really for women in the organization. Some people have said, you know, it's funny, there's no scripture cited here to support this policy change. I would flip it around. I would say that Sanderson cites every scripture in the Bible here that says that women can't wear pants. I made that video a couple months ago about uh, witness women in pants because to me that seemed like the next logical step after men were allowed to wear beards. I, I don't know if I thought it would happen this quickly, but hey, it's awesome that it did. Of course, as is always the case in Jehovah's Witnesses, this rule change will inevitably lead to dozens more rules, you know, which pants materials are allowed. 
obviously no jeans that goes without saying because of uh, reasons um, pants tightness what's too tight versus too loose you know uh, what types of underwear can you wear to prevent visible panty lines because obviously that would stumble men in the congregation uh, one interesting advantage of this new policy, maybe, is that persons assigned female at birth who are more comfortable or prefer to present in a more, quote unquote, masculine way, they're not going to get nearly as much flack anymore for not wearing skirts and dresses to the meeting. So positive. Let's go on to number eight. Brothers may choose not to wear a tie or a jacket when participating in the ministry and when attending Christian meetings, assemblies and conventions. If a brother chooses not to wear a tie or a jacket on such occasions, he should dress in a manner that is appropriate, modest, and dignified, not casual. When a brother has a part on the program, he should wear a tie and a jacket, if that is the standard of dress in that land. Of course, some brothers may choose to wear a tie or a jacket even when they do not have a part on the program. When visiting Bethel, it would be appropriate for brothers to wear a tie and a jacket and for sisters to wear a skirt or a dress if that is the standard of dress in that land. So no more ties or jackets at the meetings necessarily. Now, in certain parts of the world, especially the warmer, the more tropical areas, this has already been a normal policy, but it's a big old change for those countries. Some of those countries where witnesses have been around the longest, uh, the U.S., Canada, the U.K., Europe, and again, same deal. Removing this one rule is inevitably going to lead to a dozen more questions. Here's just one post from this morning on a popular witness forum. Can sisters attend Pioneer School in their slacks? Do brothers who are attending theocratic schools need to wear ties? Do brothers who operate the AV equipment at meetings need to be wearing a tie and jacket? Do sisters who operate the AV equipment at meetings need to be wearing a dress or skirt? At elders and servants meetings, do they have to wear a tie and jacket as it isn't exactly worship they're engaged in? Man, oh man, the questions. Okay, so those are the eight major changes I noticed in this governing body update. There's a couple other interesting points we can pick up from Sanderson's talk. One is that it tries to kind of recontextualize what disfellowshipping actually is. Instead of something that is done to a person, it's presented as something that a person does to themselves. They essentially disfellowship themselves depending on if they're unrepentant. The Bible clearly teaches that an unrepentant wrongdoer should be removed from the congregation. And really, it's a consequence that the wrongdoer has chosen. Why so? Because he refuses to respond to repeated loving attempts by the elders to lead him to repentance. And then this point is repeated again in his conclusion. As outlined at 1 Corinthians 5.13, a person who refuses to repent must be removed from the congregation. So he says that disfellowshipping is something a person chooses for himself if he's unrepentant. This is kind of a new take on shunning, and it makes a lot of sense if the religion, as we know it is, is getting flack for harmful shunning policies. It's fairly similar to their change on accepting a blood transfusion that they made back in 2000. As a background, in 1994, Bulgaria deregistered the witnesses as a religion. One of its major concerns was that witnesses were required to refuse blood, even if it killed them, or else they would be disfellowshipped. After several years of negotiation with the government, witnesses eventually agreed to remove accepting blood as a disfellowshipping offense. However, they simply shifted it to an act of disassociation. Uh, and so now how it is, is if someone accepts a blood transfusion and they're unrepentant about it, they are considered to have disassociated themselves from the organization, essentially auto-disfellowshipping. Now witnesses are attempting to frame the entire disfellowshipping process as driven by the person on trial. They're the ones that choose to be repentant or not, and if not, they are choosing to disfellowship themselves from the congregation. Obviously, the trouble with all this is that repentance is subjective. It's not objective. It cannot be measured. In fact, the Shepherd book goes on for quite a number of pages with tips and tricks for elders to use to try and divine whether a person is truly repentant or not. Uh, this is necessary since there is, to be frank, no heavenly direction telling the three elders what judgment to hand down. We can see that borne out in the fact that 
the three men essentially need to vote on whether to disfellowship the person or not. That's because they haven't all three received some divine revelation through Holy Spirit about it. And ultimately, it may be a two-to-one decision with one elder disagreeing about the verdict, but choosing to go along with the other two as the shepherd book instructs him to. So this idea that a person in a judicial committee essentially chooses their own verdict seems to be a fairly shaky argument in my mind. I don't think there's a lot of people that feel like they had a lot of say in what the elders decided. They were more just powerless subjects of the tribunal awaiting the sentence handed down to them by the three elders. So that was one point. Another point that jumped out at me in this talk is kind of new terminology that Mark Sanderson is using. People aren't disfellowshipped. They are removed from the congregation. It isn't a judicial committee. It's a committee of elders. The process under the surface is exactly the same, but the words used to describe it are softer. Interestingly, this parallels changes that the LDS, the Mormon church, made a few years ago. Just as a little background, The judicial process in the LDS religion is almost exactly the same as in the witnesses. They convene a group of three elders, which historically was always called a disciplinary council, and then they can prescribe three levels of punishment, just like the witnesses. So as a reminder, witnesses can be privately reproved with certain privileges taken away for a period of time. They can be publicly reproved. And finally, they can be disfellowshipped and expelled from the congregation. The LDS church has the same three levels of punishment. Privileges can be taken away privately, which I don't believe has a name in the LDS church. The second level was historically called disfellowshipping, which is a bit confusing for ex-witnesses, but Mormon disfellowshipping is equal to our public reproof. And then finally, the most severe punishment was called excommunication, which is equivalent to the witness disfellowshipping. However, in 2020, the LDS church rebranded all of this. The tribunal is no longer called a disciplinary council. Now it's called a church membership council. Members no longer get disfellowshipped. Now they receive formal membership restrictions. And nobody is excommunicated anymore. Now it's called removal of membership. Those terminology changes, I think, are quite powerful. It sounds much more innocuous that someone's membership has been removed versus that they were excommunicated from their church. It sounds a lot more like just some administrative thing that a secretary did with some paperwork instead of the really pretty emotionally violent and traumatic experience of being expelled after being found guilty in a church tribunal. And so as with many other areas, witnesses seem to be following again in the footsteps of the LDS church, even down to using that exact same terminology of removing someone instead of disfellowshipping them. I'm interested to see whether or not this becomes the official terminology surrounding judicial proceedings for witnesses. I mean, it definitely will sound more friendly and inoffensive in future court cases. There are some very interesting implications around these disfellowshipping changes. The changes generally overall seem to be positive, I would say. However, it's always extremely frustrating, uh, maddening, really, to see these changes announced with zero apologies, zero acknowledgement of the past harm done by the previous policies. It's unknown how many people have been driven to suicide over the decades because of having been the victim first of the judicial committee process itself, and then being punished, perhaps even expelled from the congregation. It is, as the witnesses say, undoubtedly a great crowd, which no man is able to number. Certainly, it's common enough that there's a whole section in the Shepherd book about what to do when a person in a judicial committee begins to express suicidal ideation. Another point is that it's it's unfortunate that these softer policies may well keep some people in the religion longer than they would have otherwise, either the people themselves that are going through the judicial process or others in the congregation who feel comforted that the organization is making improvements in its policies and procedures and that this must prove that it's God's organization. So yeah, those are two things I don't really like about the changes, the lack of apology for past harm and that people may stick around longer. But overall, they hopefully mean that people who are witnesses will have a better experience in the religion, or at least not as bad of an experience. And that ultimately should hopefully lead to fewer people dying by suicide. And so in that sense, all in all, I think these are good improvements for the religion. And I'm glad to see the organization taking steps to improve itself, even if it does take court cases and deregistration to get it done. 
I'm also very grateful to the XGW activists, um, the politicians, the judges, the legal staff that are using the power they have available to them to force these changes. I hate to say it, but the JW religion isn't going anywhere anytime soon. So in the meantime, we want to make it the least harmful for members who are in it, especially children in it and adults who have been born into the religion. All right. Well, that's about my thoughts on the update there. So uh, let me know what you think in the comments below. Subscribe if you like to, and uh, we'll catch you on the next video. Take care now.